and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to be part of this great web webinar. I'm really excited to see all the new people get involved in the critical zone. Um, you know, it's frequently a, a challenge, right? When you when there is a a new um, uh, sort of initiative that comes out on the national level, and it can be hard to see your way to to fit in. So hopefully, this will help people see some ways they can fit in, and also, like Kami said, network with some folks. Um, so also, as Kami mentioned. So I want to give a shout out to, I got involved with the Critical Zone because the Critical Zone was coming on board right when I was starting my um, professorship at the University of Colorado. So I was one of those people that, you know, somebody commented that they were lucky to stumble into the Critical Zone and I was lucky to be starting my academic career just as the Critical Zones were getting started. Um, but with that being said, most of the research I'm going to show you today is not actually from the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory. But being involved with the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory has really changed my thinking and helped me develop as a scientist. So I really wanted to give a shout out to Suzanne Anderson and the other PIs of the Boulder Creek Critical Zone by, um, for embracing me as a new faculty member and giving me an opportunity to get involved. Okay, so we are going to keep uh, at least for a little while, the interactive party started. So what I like to do when we talk about trees in the critical zone is especially, um, you know, because it's a very interdisciplinary topic, then there's lots of misinformation that can be out there or misconceptions about the ways trees work. So um, we're going to start with playing uh, two truths and a lie. And just to warm you up, we're going to start with me. So here are, uh, you know, one of these is a lie. Number one, I play the tuba. Number two, I'm a first generation college graduate student. Or number three, I've canoed from the island of Molokai to the island of Oahu in Hawaii. So Kamni is setting up a poll and you can guess which one of these is the lie. And I saw one of my graduate students is on there. They're not allowed to cheat. <laughs> okay, so uh, we got the poll results. You guys are very astute. Um, I do not play the tuba. Um, but I do have two tubas in my garage currently. My partner plays the tuba, uh, but I do not. Um, everything else is true. Um, I did canoe um, across the Molokai Channel um, when I was a master's student doing research in Hawaii. So when we got to pick where you'd like to be right now, I was one of the first people to pick Hawaii. Okay, um, next. Now we're gonna move on to, uh, now we're gonna move on to uh, truths and lies about trees in the critical zone. Okay, so number one, oops. Okay, Darcy's law applies to trees. Forest water use, also known as transpiration, for those of you new to terms, I'll be talking about transpiration today, controls low flows in streams. And number three, over long dry summers, the majority of the transpired water is derived from groundwater. Okay, um, so what I see, I'm not sure if you all can see it um, too, but um, is that everyone has a lot to learn today in this very short talk. So 54% of you said that Darcy's law applies to trees. Um, that, that, that's a lie. That is not a lie, that's true. Um, and uh, we kind of have a split the difference between the other two. The lie here is that over long dry summers, the majority of transpired water is derived from groundwater. 
I should add at this point, it depends on your definition of groundwater. So whenever I teach hydrology, I always talk to my class and say the first thing you should ask somebody when they talk about groundwater is what, how they define groundwater. In this case, I should have add some, added some clarification that my definition of groundwater is essentially the water table at depth, um, not simply all water within the ground. So um, if I confused you with using very specific terminology, then I apologize. But it does look like we all have something we can learn. OK, so um, this is what most people got wrong. Darcy's law does apply to water flux in trees. So as a refresher, uh, Darcy's law tells us that water flow is directly proportional to the gradient or the driving force of potential energy. So another case where we're talking about terms here is that I'm an eco-hydrologist, so I need to come at things from both an ecological perspective and a hydrological perspective. So when we're talking about trees, I'm talking about from an ecological perspective. And from an ecological perspective, uh, we think of that potential energy of water in terms of water potential. So water's potential to do work. Um, so the other aspect of Darcy's law is the permeability or the conductivity of the system. So for a tree, uh, we can look at Darcy's law in, in um, this form, not that we're gonna talk a lot about equations, but now we have flow through a tree, Q, is equal to the hydraulic conductance of a tree, which is really determined by the wood structure of the tree, uh, and then also its amount of water stress. And then the driving force, if you are a hydrologist, you would think about this in terms of a head gradient. But we're thinking about it in terms of a water potential gradient or potential energy gradient. So if the tree is well coupled to the atmosphere, which most, especially coniferous forests, are well coupled to, coupled to the atmosphere, then our transpiration rate is generally equal to Q um, as derived by Darcy's law. But I'm super excited that everyone got to learn that. So when we talk about the driving force in terms of water potential, so again, water's potential energy to do work, then we are dealing with negative pressures. So if you think about um, water doing work, it's when water is under positive pressure that it really has the ability to do work. That's how a lot of our backhoes work, a lot of our heavy, heavy machinery. But in this case, water is actually under tension, like a water band, like a rubber band, or a water band, a rubber water band. Um, so like a rubber band. So we actually have negative pressure, which is why we have um, negative values when we think about our water potential. And so water flows from areas of high potential to low potential, so less negative to more negative. And one of our biggest driving forces is that our atmosphere under you know, less than saturated conditions um, ha is very dry. So there's a driving force for evaporation um, that pulls water through the tree out to the atmosphere. And as we move up the tree, that tension gradient is going to get greater and greater. So that's our basics of how water moves through a tree. And it's important to understand that, you know, there's two ends to this. There's um, the demand side, the atmosphere, but there's what we're going to talk about is the soil side, um, the supply side. And so trees have to protect, protect their conducting system by balancing the supply and demand. And they do that by regulating how much water leaves through their leaves, um, through the pore spaces in the canopy. Okay, so one of the most common questions I get is how do we measure transpiration? So this is pretty fun, um, at least I think, because it's so simple and elegant. So we use heat as a tracer. Um, this is just one variation um, of a, what we call sap flow sensor or transpiration sensor. And this is one of the simplest ones, but there's all of them that I work with um, fundamentally work on the concept of heat dissipation in water. So in the simplified version, we have a probe, which is literally um, a hypodermic needle that we insert into the tree. It has a heater coil in it, so current is injected into this, which heats up the, the wire inside. And then down here, we have a reference sensor. And then we have thermocouples in both of them that measure the temperature, and we measure the temperature difference between the two. So as water moves up the tree through its conducting tissue, it carries heat away from the heated probe which makes the temperature difference between the reference and the heated smaller and smaller. So the bigger the, the temperature difference, 
the um, less flow there is and the less the temperature difference, the more flow there is because more heat is being dissipated as water flows through. So um, there's variations on this, like I said, but almost all of them use heat as a tracer, which is um, pretty, I think, like I said, elegant and nice. Okay, so as a ecohydrologist, we I think about how trees interact with the subsurface. And so we can look at hydrology's most basic equation, the water balance equation. And just so I'm not using Q multiple times, in this case, I've used R for stream runoff or stream flow. And so our stream flow, as you know, is a function of our precipitation inputs minus our um, evapotranspiration outputs minus our change in storage. So what I'm interested in is looking at A, quantifying this transpiration rate, but really what the critical zone has done for me in terms of critical zone science has really pushed me to think about this interaction with storage and how differences in storage and differences in the way water is stored in the subsurface, how does that affect both the tree and the stream? Okay, so um, trees are like that person, that really annoying person in class who never ever studied but always got an A. So they're super lazy. Um, they only passively take up water. So one of the myths about trees is that you'll hear people say is that trees actively pump water out of the subsurface. Trees do not want to work that hard. Everything about the, the trees um, water use is passive. It's all driven by that driving force of water potential. And the thing, the only thing the tree does that's very active is open and close the pore spaces in its leaves to control how much water it, it uses. So it just like sits in the back of the class, chills out and like always gets an A um, despite doing very little work. So, uh, but they're super smart. Um, so trees passively move water in the subsurface, but we also want to understand uh, what parts of the, the subsurface um, connect trees to the stream. So in this example here, during the day, the lights come on, the sun comes up, that causes the stomata, the pores and the leaves to open. And then the trees passively take water up and transfer it to the subsurface to the atmosphere. During the night, um, the stomata close, the trees um, do very little transpiring at night, and as a result, it changes the uh, water potential gradient in the subsurface, and now um, instead of water being pulled out through the atmosphere, it has an opportunity to drain um, deeper into the subsurface. So we can see this connection directly, especially during low flow conditions. So when we go back to our two truths and a lie, so um, under, under temperate environments where we have strong seasonality um, in both our precipitation and in our stream discharge, then we see um, a pretty uniform expression of transpiration's impact on stream flow. So here's an example here from the H.J. Andrews in Oregon, where we have evapotranspiration in millimeters per hour. And this is just looking over about the course of a month here. So every day, lights come on, trees start using water. So we have large um, fluxes going to the atmosphere. And then we get a corresponding decline in stream discharge um, on a 24 hour or diel cycle. So we can see this expression of transpiration clearly gets transferred to the stream. But again, the subsurface piece makes it difficult to understand how these two things are connected. So one of the questions that we have is where spatially, so we understand temporally, so during low flow conditions, we get a strong connection between transpiration and stream flow, but we don't understand really spatially what trees are causing um, this relationship. So there were two competing hypotheses out there that um, are generally, have generally been considered. So one is, this saturated wedge hypothesis, where that is similar to what I explained in terms of the cycle, in terms of trees using water during the day and essentially uh, changing the water potential gradient or the head gradient in groundwater during the day. So it decreases groundwater flow going to the stream. So you get that reduction in stream flow. And then at night when the trees, the gradient has 
um, change because the trees have turned off, then we end up with a steeper head gradient and more flow going towards the stream. So under this scenario, the saturated wedge that goes all the way up the hill slope, then all trees on the hill slope have the potential to contribute to this pattern of up and down day and night cycles um, with stream flow. In contrast, lots of work from experimental forest where um, they've had the opportunity to do some experimental cut cutting have also observed that once you remove trees from the hill slope, we still get this really clear expression of the transpiration signal in the stream. And that um, led to this riparian interception hypothesis, where only trees closest to the stream that are tapping directly into groundwater, which is feeding the stream during low flow conditions, um, have an impact and create this, this signal. So we know that trees matter, but we also can tell that under these different scenarios that the hydrogeology or the structure of the subsurface may play a role in when and where trees um, impart this control on stream flow. So what we did is um, went to the H.J. Andrews Forest. So I did my PhD work here and then um, did some follow-up work um, with one of your hosts, Kamni Singha, and her graduate students um, to examine how the subsurface um, serves to buffer or exacerbate this connection between transpiration and stream flow. So this is a really good example of how we're doing critical zone science, but it's not in an official critical zone observatory. So again, you can take these concepts and apply them wherever you want and still make a connection. So in this scenario, this is a very small watershed, watershed 10, it's only 10 hectares. And we, um, it established some monitoring on three different hill slopes that varied in their riparian to hill slope structure. So here I will remind you throughout which hill slopes are which, but hill, hill slope A had very little um, riparian structure um, and relatively thin soils. Hill slope B up in this upper section of the catchment has a pretty well um, developed riparian area, at least for a small catchment. And then hill slope C here is something in between. So sort of a mild riparian area, um, but they differ in their subsurface structure. So within each hill slope, we monitored transpiration. We also put in uh, groundwater wells that extended from the near stream zone or riparian area where there was a riparian area, and then up through the hill slope. In addition, we also uh, monitored things you know, like standard things like soil moisture. Okay, so there's a lot going on in on this figure, but we'll we'll walk through it here. So, um, <laughs> so the here at the top is the sap flow going through the entire growing season, essentially from early June until late September, early October. So you see those nice diurnal 24-hour cycles in most cases, unless it's raining. And then um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how soil moisture change seasonally. So here in this panel in green, and this color indicates the amount of stress that the tree would be feeling um, or be experiencing, I shouldn't say feeling, um, would be experiencing under those different soil moisture conditions. So remember how I said that the tree has to um, monitor itself or regulate itself to prevent too much water stress. So it's, this is that balance of supply and demand. So as our uh, soil moisture declines, that supply becomes more limited, the demand rem remains high during the growing season, and as a result the tree is more stressed. So here on Hill Slope B, this is where we had um, a pretty well established riparian area. And here in uh, red is we're looking at if there's a relationship between fluctuations in groundwater driven by transpiration um, or not, and then how strong that connection is. So where you see a gray bar, that means there was no connection between transpiration and groundwater. And then the higher up these red dots go, that means the stronger the correlation was. So we get um, brief periods, especially where we enter stressed periods, um, for the tree, where we get this connection between groundwater level 
And then also just the strength of that connection. So how tightly coupled are those up and down sinusoidal um, relationships? So if we look at hill slope C, though, this was the one with a moderate um, development of riparian area. So, and here the trees are getting much more stressed um, and the stress is being prolonged for much longer throughout the growing season. So the soil here is drying out faster. And as a result, you see that we get A, persistent um, relationships between groundwater level um, and also that the relationship, the correlation between transpiration and fluctuations in groundwater remain very, very high. So the one thing I should say here is that um, this is for groundwater that is in those wells closest to the, the, in the, closest to the stream, in that near stream zone or in that riparian buffer area. So how does this relate to subsurface structure? So um, PhD student Ryan Harmon recently had a paper published um, that re reports these findings. But as he was installing all of these groundwater wells, what Ryan was able to do was also you know, log the material as it came out. So what we see here is Hill Slope A. So that was the one with no riparian area. So we actually saw, never saw any sort of diol fluctuations in those wells. So this has very thin soils. It has um, some weather bedrock, um, and then we get into largely consolidated bedrock, but we never saw the water table rise into that, un into that weathered fractured bedrock zone. In contrast, Hill Slope B, uh, which had the well-developed riparian area, has thicker soils, so it has more um, water supply from the soil going to the trees, but then we have the in the near stream zone, we have the water table that is right at that sort of weathered bedrock soil interface. So when the trees get stressed and soil moisture declines, then the trees have an opportunity to begin to tap into some of those water sources. But we didn't see diol fluctuations more in the upslope location. So this would be more consistent with that riparian interception hypothesis. And then Hill Slope C, where we saw the strongest relationships between transpiration and groundwater fluctuations in the riparian area. Um, so this case, it has thinner soils again, but then it has a very thick area of fractured bedrock. Um, and the water table is in intersecting that fractured bedrock. So what we see is that here we have the strongest connection where A, a reduction in substrate of soil substrate leads to the trees relying on that weathered bedrock rock water there, and that we also have this perfect storm, so to, so to speak, or perfect conditions where the water table intersects that fractured area, making it accessible to trees. So in this situation, no diol fluctuations, irregular fluctuations because of large soil water availability, and here, where we have large fractured water availability, but less soil water, we have the most persistent fluctuations. Okay, so that's, that's nice, but like what about when there's very little soil? The H.J. Andrews, you know, it has anywhere from half a meter to four meters of soil, so you can have wide variability in that available soil moisture before trees have to rely on rock water. But what if we go to a situation like this, or we have trees growing in fractures, or we have very little substrate available. And for this, we're going to go to the Eel River Critical Zone Observatory and um, look at some of the re really interesting results there. So this is the work of Daniela Rimpe, who I think has really been um, you know, leading the, the science on this interaction between trees and critical zone rock water. Um, and how rock meets life. I think that was one of the, the phrases that people thought of when they thought of the critical zone. So um, Daniela, she worked in the system at Eel River in the coast, coastal California. And Daniela was really interested in um, how do we characterize that moisture that's in that highly weathered fractured bedrock system. So the way she defines it here is that we have very thin soil matrix, and in this case, we have um, a very deep layer of weathered rock and fractured rock. 
And this rock moisture she's concerned with is what lies above the groundwater table. But um, so you can think of this as the beta zone or the unsaturated zone of rock. Okay, so these are some photos for, from Daniela's site where you can see that tree roots are being very effective at mining into this rock substrate. And so because there's very little soil available, so there's, um, you know, they need, need to anchor, there's cracks for the, the roots to, to mine. But then here we have, again, this weathered rock where we have the opportunity for water to be stored very similar in the same way that soil moisture is stored. So it's stored in rock porosity, but it also has the opportunity to be stored in larger, um, what we, we think of as macro pores in the soil, but rock fractures. For all you geologists out there, you can laugh at me when I talk about rocks. <laughs> okay, so what Daniela did is she used a, a neutron probe and other geophysics te techniques to look at how rock moisture varied um, seasonally. So here they had a whole network of wells going up at their hill slope. And this is just a, a snapshot from four different wells where they use the neutron probe seasonally to look at differences in moisture. So here um, with the gray and brownish colors on each bar on the right gives you an idea of the weathering state of the rock. So in some cases we have a little bit of soil on top followed by highly weathered saprolite then um, weathered fracture rock, and then unweathered intact bedrock in black. The blue indicates the level of the water table. So what you see here is that um, once you're below the water table, there's very little difference seasonally in terms of the amount of moisture stored, but above the water table, there's large variation. So if we look at the difference between the red being the end of the dry season, and then the blue being at the end of the wet season, this difference is that storage in the rock water. So A, um, we predominantly see that the rock water is stored in the upper five to 10 uh, meters. And, that, and that, that's this area of dynamic storage of rock water. When we get down below, like in this case, below about 10 meters, there's very little seasonal variability. So, the thing that's notable about this is that just because rock water declined seasonally, then one might think, oh, well, of course it declined because there's gonna be gravitational drainage, which is going to contribute to um, a rise in the water table. But what they actually see is that at the same time as that the rock water is declining, the groundwater table is also declining. So the, the rock water is not contributing um, to an increase in groundwater storage or uh, a rise in water table. Again, there's that loose word groundwater. So, but you know, what does not go down must go up to be a loss. And so what they've seen is that we can attribute this loss, um, seasonal loss in rock water to water being supplied for transpiration. So uh, based on their estimates of porosity and fractures, that the rock moisture stores up, up to a third of the annual precipitation in this system. And then that's what is able to sustain transpiration. And so why do, you, why do we care? So if you've been following the news in terms of thinking about you know, the recent droughts in California, that there's been um, you know, over 100 million trees die in California. And globally, we are also sort of at a, a level of a epidemic or pandemic in terms of tree death. So um, climate change has been driving a lot of drought and water stress driven tree mortality. But in this system um, that Daniela was st studying, this rock moisture actually protected these trees from drought mortality. In this system, despite widespread mortality, there's been minimal or almost no mortality in this area. So we think that that rock moisture can provide um, an additional buffer to, to climate stress. So, but this isn't just unique to California. So, you know, across the US and across different rock types, we can see examples of tree roots being deeply rooted within the rock matrix. So, you know, what's interesting here, and I think is an open question, is in what systems, under what conditions, do we see this interaction between rock water 
um, soil water and what sustains tree life. So we saw that in the Andrews that we can be highly spatially variable. We saw in Daniela's work that it can buffer against large scale mortality. So um, I think this is one of the uh, most exciting areas in terms of ecohydrology. So just to sum it up, what I said, yeah, the source water for trees is dynamic, spatially and temporally. We think it could be highly species specific in terms of rooting depth and rooting behavior and sensitivity to drought. Um, but what I really want people to take home here is that I think this combination of where rock meets life and thinking about ecological questions within the context of hydrogeology is really an exciting area. So I just wanted to finish up and just say, um, if you're still interested in trees in the critical zone, that um, I'm always interested in talking to people about opportunities, um, whether you're interested in um, coming to CU Boulder or interacting with my smarter friends than me. Um, so I've been really happy and um, uh, lucky to um, be involved with a lot of collaborators that can explain hydrogeology to me and I can explain trees to them. And I think it's really been a very um, fruitful and exciting um, collaborative relationship. So um, I just wanted to leave that with um, an open invitation. So with that, I'll stop 